Diane Wagner has been a guiding spirit in planning this conference for months and is therefore wholly responsible for anything you don't like about it. <laughs> Diane has brought to the planning of this event, as she brings to the study of Lewis Carroll, a wide-ranging breadth of intelligence rare in any field. Her Yale dissertation in art history was an interdisciplinary examination of photography, narrative, the visual imagination, and the vexed formulation of the idea of childhood. Now an assistant curator in the Department of Photog Photographs at the National Gallery of Art, Diane served previously as the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Curatorial Fellow at the Huntington Library here, and has also held positions at Yale University Art Gallery and the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. She is editor of The Beauty of Life, William Morris and the Art of Design, and has published extensively on Lewis Carroll and photography. She brings her expertise to bear today on an issue seldom addressed in Carroll studies, but surfacing often in the way we talk about Carroll and the child, glibly ignoring the issue of gender. More bluntly, what about Carroll and boys? Diane will speak to us on Little Men, Lewis Carroll's photographs of boys. In 1857, Charles Lutwidge Dodson published a poem, Hiawatha's Photographing, which satirically described three failed photographs chronicling developmental stages of masculinity. Dodson's poem was later illustrated by A.B. Frost in 1883. It begins with a description of the photograph of the father of a family, and on the left, you see Frost's drawing of the father aping Grand Manor portraiture in an exaggerated contrapuntal posture with hand tucked in his, into his waistcoat. On the right, is Frost's illustration of the oldest son, the university student, attempting to fix himself into an aesthetic curvilinear posture against the backdrop of a screen filled with sunflowers. And now, <laughs> on the right, is the worst photograph of the sitting, the youngest boy, whom Dodson dubbed the scrubby schoolboy in the poem, and who sulkily holds a tense, angular, and uncomfortable pose with the help of a stand with a head clamp. <laughs> Frost's illustration of the, this imaginary photograph even includes adult hands intruding into the photographic frame to indicate the trouble the rest of the family had to get the boy to stay still for the camera. Dodson's caricatures trace the narrative arc of a male life backwards from patriarch to young man to boy. By doing so, he establishes the patriarch as father to the boy, but conversely, the boy as father to the man. The fidgetiness of the young boy in Frost's illustration metamorphoses into the silly posturing of the university student and ends finally in the misguided pompousness of the father. This movement from boyhood to manhood has no counterpart in trajectory from girlhood to womanhood in the poem. Dodson satirizes the photographs of the mother and the grown daughter, but tellingly does not include a description of a photograph of a little girl. According to received interpretation, Dodson had no particular interest in the boy as a potential child friend or as a photographic subject. Dodson's description of the horrid boy in Hiawatha's photographing, with its evocation of grubbiness and bad temper, supports some of Dodson's own statements that commentators have often used to contend that Dodson did not like boys. For example, he wrote in different letters that, quote, with little boys, I'm out of my element altogether, unquote, end quote, for I confess I do not admire naked boys in pictures. They always seem to me to need clothes, whereas one hardly sees why the lovely forms of girls should ever be covered up." Unquote. I do not want to suggest that Dodson's interest in boys rivaled that for girls, but nonetheless, I would like to oppose this central myth to assert that Dodson's attitude toward the young male extended well beyond satire and dislike. Dodson photographed boys far more than is generally thought. He photographed the sons of his adult friends and the brothers of the girls he befriended throughout the 24 years he took photographs. For example, Greville MacDonald, son of his friend and fellow children's author George MacDonald, who you see on the left, and Arthur Hughes, son of the artist Arthur Hughes, who you see on the right. And Hallam Tennyson, son of poet Alfred Tennyson, who you see now on the left, 
and Brook and Hugh Kitchen, sons of friend, of friend George William Kitchen, who you see now on the right. More than just photographing the sons and brothers of his friends, however, in 1859, Dodson took a series of photographs that differ from the majority of his portrait photographs. Oops. Sorry. Probably with his Oxford friend, Reginald Southey, Dodson photographed schoolboys at a preparatory school where boys around the ages of 8 to 14 were prepared for public schools like Rugby, Eton, and Marlborough. The school was Twyford School, headed by Dodson's friend George William Kitchen and attended by Dodson's three younger brothers, as well as Harry Little. Harry Little, of course, was the son of the Dean of Christ Church and the older brother to his more famous sisters, Lorena, Alice, and Edith, to whom Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was first told. These Twyford School photographs figure as prominently in Dodson's photograph albums as any series of photographs of groups of little girls and their brothers Yet, until the collection at the Princeton University Library was published in full, only one or two of these had ever been reproduced in any biographies of Dodson or books on Dodson's photography or on his writing. My paper today will focus on this series of photographs of schoolboys and position them within changing definitions of masculinity and boys' education. In the mid-Victorian period, the education of boys underwent, underwent an important transformation most famously exemplified in Thomas Arnold's reform of rugby school. While Arnold was the most famous innovator in British boys' education, he was one of several headmasters who effected change at prominent public schools. Dodson's photographs of Twyford schoolboys fit precisely within this historical shift and should be understood in this context. In this schoolboy series, I would like to suggest Dodson chooses to visualize the development of a manly boyhood cultivated in the institution of the public school that asserts a seamless transition from childhood to adulthood. While Dodson's photographs grouped girls in private spaces, his Twyford photographs grouped boys bound together by the homosocial ties of the school rather than the family. Moreover, these changes are manifested in the bodies of the boys. Dodson photographs their bodies as they grow into the control and discipline that he satirized in his humorous description of the photograph of the father in his poem, Hiawatha's Photographing. Before I discuss Dodson's Twyford photographs more closely, I want to take some time to consider the transformation of boys' education at rugby. As I just mentioned, rugby holds an important place in the history of British boys' education and in particular for Dodson, since it was the school he himself attended. When the young Dodson was sent to rugby, he arrived there in 1846, a few years after the death of Thomas Arnold, who had served as headmaster from 1829 until his death in 1842. The institution's reputation was on the rise due to Arnold's reforms. The radical shift that occurred in boys' education during this time articulated a new concept of boyhood as the path to developing manliness. At rugby, Arnold aimed to develop, in his own words, quote, first, religious and moral principle, secondly, gentlemanly conduct, and thirdly, intellectual ability, unquote. Manliness thus had several dimensions to it, moral, intellectual, and physical, including the ability to regulate sexual desire properly. But the emphasis was placed on the strength of character. This notion of manliness, it should be understood, was deeply Christian, and propagated by Christian socialists and so-called muscular Christians, such as Charles Kingsley, F.D. Morris, Thomas Hughes, and Thomas Arnold himself. The exclusively masculine environment of the school was meant to instill manliness into the boy and prepare him for entry into the adult masculine world, to give him the necessary qualities of discipline, independence, self-reliance, and character that he would need to negotiate that world successfully. These ideas about boyhood and manliness found their popular expression in the widely read Tom Brown's School Days, Thomas Hughes' fictionalized account of his schooling at rugby published in 1857, two years before Dodson's photographs at Twyford School. The book was illustrated by Arthur Hughes in 1869. Hughes' novel chronicles the years at rugby of his hero, Tom Brown, an athletic-minded, robust, and sometimes rowdy boy who, in the first half of the book, suffers as a younger boy from bullying, and in the second half, learns the importance of moral and intellectual character from his friend, 
the more studious and pious George Arthur, whom Thomas Arnold asks him to befriend. These two illustrations show these two sides, physical and moral, of school life. On the left, Tom and his friend together defeat their enemy, an older bully, and on the right, Tom comforts Arthur while he's recuperating from an illness. But what, in fact, did Arnold change at rugby? He did not radically alter the educational system of the school already in place. He did expand the range of subjects taught by giving greater, greater emphasis to mathematics, modern languages, English, history, and geography over Latin and Greek. But his great innovation was to change the internal organization of power between the constituencies of the masters and the boys divided into forms. Among the boys, a system of prefects and fags in which older boys, the prefects, required younger boys, the fags, to serve them and obey their commands, which had developed gradually in the public schools over the centuries among the boys and independently from the masters. Arnold, however, gave the sixth form, the oldest boys, a privileged place within the hierarchy of the school and allowed only boys in the sixth form to have fags. Arnold forbade this privilege to all boys in the forms below. This is Arthur Hughes' illustration showing Tom Brown waiting for orders while serving as a fag during the night to the older boys. The oldest boys were thus institutionally given responsibility over the younger boys and were required to see that the younger boys did not break any rules, a duty that in theory encouraged the sixth formers to observe the rules themselves. This system was meant to reduce the practice of bullying. Arnold, according to a school historian, quote, treated the elder boys as gentlemen and as reasoning beings at an age when their reason was beginning to develop and their natures to respond to a generous tr trust, unquote. And a report issued in 1864 by the Public Schools Commission lauded Rugby's system of governance, stating, quote, it has largely assisted, we believe, to create and keep alive a high and sound tone of feeling and opinion, has promoted independence and manliness of character, and has rendered possible that combination of ample liberty with order and discipline, which is among the best characteristics of great English schools." End quote. Arnold's system thus relied on an internalized notion of duty and discipline to govern the boys, which in turn developed the appropriate qualities of manliness. Arnold furthermore revised the boys' living system. This is a photograph of Schoolhouse, which was Dodson's house while he was a student at rugby. Prior to Arnold's time, masters paid little attention to the boys outside of the classroom, and boys often roamed the surrounding countryside following their own pursuits. By the 1840s and 1850s, however, the time that boys spent outside the classroom was organized into activity and observed by the masters. Arnold phased out the dame's houses where many of the boys had lived and transferred them into the charge of his assistant masters in different houses, where the masters were expected to supervise them. By consolidating all the boys into houses under the control of the masters, Arnold and his teaching staff exerted control over every aspect of the boys' lives. As Hughes described in Tom Brown's School Days, quote, the object of all schools is not to ram Latin and Greek into boys, but to make them good English boys, good future citizens. And by far, the mo most important part of that work must be done out of school hours. One of the most important changes out of school hours that was institutionalized was the playing of physical games, creating a culture that celebrated athleticism. Hughes summed up this new perception of sports in Tom Brown's school days by including several scenes on the playing field. The illustration on the left is of the boys preparing for football and on the right of a conversation taking place on the sidelines of a cricket match. Although not in fact due to Arnold's reforms, what has come to be called the games ethic developed at rugby by the masters that Arnold appointed under him and at other prominent schools at mid-century. Before then, sports had been conducted loosely and in a free-for-all manner by schoolboys and were generally disapproved of by masters. Organized games helped masters keep track of their pupils outside of class and restricted the boys to the grounds of the school. Games also taught the boys teamwork, discipline, and stoicism and developed a healthy body. 
This in turn was thought to cultivate a healthy mind and character, mens sana in corpore sano. Athletics were also seen as the means of regulating sexual energy. The athletic boy was assumed to be innocent of mind. Despite Arnold's reforms, physical and emotional bullying continued to be an endemic problem in the public schools, and life could be harsh for schoolboys. The social structure implemented by Arnold depended not just on the supervision of the master and the threat of punishment from him, but was imposed from boy to boy, enforced in the extreme in bullying. Hughes' Tom Brown School Days, as I mentioned earlier, chronicles the bullying that Tom received as a younger boy at rugby at the hands of an older classmate. In this illustration by Arthur Hughes, Tom is rescued by another boy after being physically bullied by being held so close to the fire that he suffers burns on his leg. <coughs> when Dodson photographed boys at Twyford School, he was revisiting an experience he himself had gone through. This silhouette on the left is the only known image of Dodson as a young boy. <coughs> Dodson's recollection of his time at rugby are few, but he bitterly recalled the bullying he experienced both during the day and at night. In the new houses that Arnold organized, the boys slept together in large dormitories and were given no respite from the scrutiny of their peers. One of Dodson's only comments in his diary about rugby was this observation, quote, from my own experience of school life at rugby, I can say that if I could have been thus secure from annoyance at night, the hardships of the daily life would have been comparative trifles to bear, unquote. He wrote further of his time with strong dislike, quote, I cannot say that I look back upon my life at public school with any sensations of pleasure or that any earthly considerations would induce me to go through my three years again, unquote. Dodson, by his nephew Stuart Dodson Collingwood's account, was a sensitive boy. Collingwood wrote, rugby almost crushed him. His shy and sensitive nature could not stand the ways of public school, unquote. And one tangible piece of evidence of the teasing and bullying that Dodson may have endured is in one of his school books, which you see here, where next to his signature, C.L. Dodson, another boyish hand has added the insult is a muff. Although only referred to indirectly, sexual bullying too was a threat. It is possible that Dotson was alluding to sexual as well as physical bullying in his description of annoyance at night, although we can never really know that. Some five years after leaving rugby to attend Christ Church at Oxford, Dodson, who you see in the photograph on the left at the age of 25, made a number of visits to Twyford School between 1855 and 1858 as indicated by his extant diaries, and probably until 1860. By this time, Dodson was a student, the equivalent of a fellow, at Christ Church, and had just begun his appointment as a mathematics lecturer there. Dodson had several reasons to visit Twyford. As I mentioned earlier, among the school's pupils were Harry Little and Dodson's younger brother Edwin and his cousin James Dodson, both of whom would leave Twyford by 1860 to attend rugby. Furthermore, Dodson's good friend from Christ Church, Kitchen, was headmaster, whose photograph by Dodson you now see on the right, and John Martin Collins, another Christ Church friend, was also a master there. Dodson's December 1857 description in his diaries of a visit to Twyford, although not a visit that involved photography, to stay with Collins expresses his enjoyment of the company of the young boys he encountered there. On his first day, he had, quote, tea in the large room with the boys, met in the evening the third master and Mr. Smith of Ripon. And this is Dodson's later photograph of Alfred Smith, the third master, on the left. The next day, Dodson had, quote, wine in Collins' room after the two o'clock dinner, to which he asked Jimmy Dodson and Harry Little. And the following day, he again saw James Dodson and Harry Little, writing that, quote, Collins had over to his rooms after tea, Jimmy Dodson and Harry Little, as before, and two other boys, Mallet and Manning, the former, a remarkably nice-looking and gentlemanly boy, unquote. And that is Dodson's photograph of Clement Mallet um, on the right. Dodson's visits to Twyford were part of a larger interest in boys' education 
that he documented in his diaries in the late 1850s. In these diary entries, he gives unusually substantive opinions that echo Arnold's and Hughes' ideas of manliness and that often evaluate the boys for their qualities of gentlemanliness and his, as in his comments about Mallet. And this were during several visits that he made to a number of different um, schools because a lot of his friends from Christ Church had gone on to become masters um, at some of the other preparatory schools around the country. Under Kitchen's headmastership, Twyford School, like rugby before it, had changed considerably and had an excellent reputation. This is Dodson's photograph of the main school building with a master and a few pupils standing in the doorway, <coughs> which might be a little bit hard to see, but they are, they are right there, sort of silhouetted in, silhouetted in the little porch. Dodson further commented in his diary on the educational structure of Twyford School, writing, quote, I like very much the system of freedom and intimacy which prevails here between masters and boys, though there must often be a risk of the boys passing over the bounds of the respect due to their masters. It is quite the system of ruling by love, and with a master like Kitchen seems to answer well, but I should doubt if there are many in whose hands it would succeed." Unquote. Dawson's <coughs> comment implies a suspicion of a system of boys' education without rigid boundaries between teachers and pupils and codes of appropriate behavior prescribed for each. But he favors the lessening of boundaries in the case of Kitchen and Twyford School because of Kitchen's particular skill. The school had not been so well regarded before Kitchen's tenure. Twyford School was, in fact, also Thomas Hughes' own preparatory school. He attended there from 1830 to 1833 before going on to rugby. And Twyford School, like rugby, makes an appearance in Tom Brown's school days, portrayed as Hughes' hero's own preparatory school, but in unflattering terms. As described by Hughes in his novel, the school's masters were gentlemen, but they only taught the lessons, and the supervision of the boys was left to two ushers, who are described as being not being gentlemen, and did not properly supervise the boys outside the classroom. Because the ushers were allowed the bigger boys to oppress the smaller boys and encourage tattling, Twyford School, in its earlier days, is described as the anti-rugby, where the boys were not taught by appropriate masters, not supervised fully out of the classroom, did not learn the appropriate characteristics of manliness, and thus encouraged bullying. But George William Kitchen transformed the school during his tenure as headmaster from 1854 to 1861, 20 years after Hughes' time there. The school historian characterized these years as a golden period. As at rugby, Kitchen's changes altered the nature of the relationship between master and boys from the freewheeling days described by Hughes in Tom Brown's school days. His improvements increased the headmaster's contact with the boys and organized their time both inside and outside of the classroom. Kitchen also instituted a system of shaming to call attention to bad behavior and reward good behavior. He kept a black book, which was made public at the end of each term with prizes given to boys with good records. And although it's not documented, Kitchen did most likely practice corporal punishment, as did Arnold at rugby, because it was a standard practice at, in boys' schools throughout the 19th century. By making bad behavior public, Kitchen policed the boys by a system that drew upon public shaming and peer reputation, and he also increased the playing of organized games. Twyford, Twyford thus readily adopted the games ethic, and Arnold's system of benevolent rule with the, its institutionalized sense of responsibility and surveillance of all aspects of the students' lives. Dotson's Twyford photographs date after the visits he mentioned in his diary. The photographs themselves were taken in 1859, a period for which Dotson's diaries are missing, so therefore there is no written record of Dotson's photographing of the schoolboys. Dotson's friend and fellow photographer Reginald Suthy, whose self-portrait you see, also took several photographs at Twyford, possibly accompanying Dotson. Because some of Dotson's photographs appear in Suthy's photograph albums, and Suthy gave Dotson prints of other photographs, it is not entirely clear whether the two collaborated on some of these photographs or took them separately and exchanged prints. 
Several of Dodson's Twyford photographs show the schoolboys set against the architecture of the school. In Dodson's time, the school was composed of two buildings, the original a farmhouse joined to an addition by a brick paved courtyard, described by the school historian as bounded by a covered way, which in summer was open to the courtyard and in winter was closed in with wooden shutters. The most frequently photographed spot in Dodson's pictures is probably this covered way, showing his subjects pose between wood and lattice arches, as you see in the photograph on the right. Several of Dodson's photographs group a large number of the schoolboys together. These photographs look different from Dodson's group photographs of sisters, such as this photograph of the Smith sisters playing chess from the same year in which the relationships are family ties. In his photographs of the Twyford boys, Dodson distinguishes institutional relationships from familial ones. They are almost unique as large groups of children not connected to each other through a sibling relationship among Dodson's photographs. Dodson's photograph albums, in fact, contain four group photographs of the schoolboys, each of which figure differing aspects of the homosocial world of the school. This group, labeled Seven Twyford Boys in his album, is placed with the signatures of the subjects underneath. In this photograph, the first six boys are crammed in a row on a sofa all with legs crossed, and the seventh leans against the edge on the right. The sofa would have been brought outdoors into the covered way for the purpose of the photograph. The boy's facial expressions vary from sullen to placid and calm, and the direction of their gazes also range from shy stares downward to straightforward looks at Dodson behind the camera. Their postures, however, are all of a piece. The crossed legs, the rigid backs, the boy on the right's slightly contrapuntal pose resemble the poses of their adult male counterpart, counterparts in Dodson's portrait photographs, the kind of considered pose that Dodson caricatured in his description of the father in Hiawatha's photographing, or that you see here in this example, a photograph of Bishop John Jackson taken at Christ Church in 1860. In a second and similar group photograph, five rougher looking boys, including on the far left, Mallet, the boy whose gentlemanliness Dodson had admired in his diary, stand in a row with arms around each other. All but the boy, second from the left, look out toward the camera with forbidding expressions on their faces, as if members of a closed society with its own rules. These boys are the same in kind, in age and strength, and in education and in class. Measured against each other and displayed to Dodson's camera and the viewer, these boys affirm their desired identities as boys, robust and healthy in mind and body, aspiring to be the ideal boys of Arnold and Hughes. The same is true of the third group photograph, which is of the Twyford 11, the school's cricket team, in a tent. These boys have variably grumpy, saucy, or blank facial expressions, but the grouping is again a tableau of disciplined, and in some cases, swaggering attitudes. These boys are grouped together by sport, a part of Twyford School's developing culture of athleticism and showing the cultivation of physical health. The importance of cricket is commented upon by a young master in Tom Brown's school days who praises, quote, the discipline and reliance on one another which cricket teaches are so valuable, it merges the individual into the 11." Unquote. Dodson's photograph of the cricket team, probably one of the earliest team photographs in the history of photography, quick, quickly realizes the conventions of the team photograph with its rows of densely packed team members taken from a distance so that the individual does indeed merge into the team. Finally, Dodson's fourth group photograph is of a class of nine boys on the side lawn of the school sitting on a bench while Headmaster Kitchen sits in a chair. Each boy has a book in his lap while one boy stands as if reading out loud. In this photograph, Dodson represents the school at work in the process of teaching and therefore in the cultivation of the boy's intellect. The blurred heads of some of the boys 
as if truly photographed during class rather than posing, supports the illusion. This last photograph also pictures the closeness between master and boys that Dodson had remarked upon in his diary. Reginald Suffy was to take this closeness even further in the photographs that he placed in his photograph albums. Suffy posed Twyford masters and boys together. The photograph shown on the left is of Kitchen with a student, while on the right is the master Alfred Smith with another student. Kitchen and student seem relaxed next to each other, while Smith and student appear more strained, but Suffy, <laughs> yes, they do feel like a little strained. But uh, Suffy attempts to capture what Dodson described as the freedom and intimacy between master and boy. In both cases, the masters <laughs> exhibit the confident and controlled postures of the adult gentlemen, and the boys do their best to appear the same. Dodson's other Twyford photographs represent more intimate friendships between the boys themselves. A portrait of Dodson's younger brother Edwin and another student, Turner, appears in both Dodson's and Sethi's albums. The attitudes of their bodies are somewhat awkward. The two boys want to pose like men, as in the photographs by Suffy, though they have not quite succeeded. While Edmund stares demurely downward, Turner stares at the camera and Dodson with a straightforward expression. The bond of friendship between these two boys, with Edwin's arm around Turner, visualizes the ideal of intimacy among boys, the homosocial friendships of the school environment. This photograph is all the more remarkable when the point is made that the physical intimacy shown between the boys is never matched in the rare cases that girls who are not related to each other are photographed together by Dodson. <coughs> Thomas Hughes in Tom Brown's School Days yet again sums up in prose what Dodson and Sethi articulate in their photographs of groups of boys and of boy-boy and master-boy emotional bonds. The epigraph to Hugh's novel is a quotation from Arthur Penry and Stanley, Arnold's disciple and biographer, who wrote, quote, as on the one hand, it should ever be remembered that we are boys and boys at school, so on the other hand, we must bear in mind that we form a complete social body, a society in which, by the nature of the case, we must not only learn, but act and live and act and live not only as boys, but as boys who will be men." Unquote. This becoming and boyhood, the movement from boy to man, is learned by the discipline of the school and manifested in the bodies of the boys. Dodson's photographs chronicle this process of gaining mastery. In the school traditions established by Kitchen at Twyford, and in the systems revised by Arnold at Rugby, which established both the authority of the master and the authority of the peer, in the allowed bullying among the boys and the lack of privacy that Dodson lamented, in the self-policing -poli system of prefects and houses, the boy looked to his masters and to his peers to internalize the way he himself should look. Earlier, I showed these two portraits of the master Alfred Smith and the boy Mallet whom Dodson thought was a, quote, remarkably nice looking and gentlemanly boy, unquote. They are both typical of Dodson's single portrait style. Mallet appears by himself, seated in a chair against a wall. He crosses his legs and holds his cap in his hands in his lap. His frank expression and direct look at the camera support Dodson's description. By employing the adjective gentlemanly, Dodson has indicated that he sees Mallet as a little man a forecast of the gentleman he will become from his training and education at Twyford School and later at public school and the university, a gentleman like his master Smith, who Dodson photographs in the same pose. As Hughes' epigraph testifies, Mallet at school not only learns and acts, but he also acts and lives his class and his gender and his physical body. He somatically inhabits his projected adult male self. Dodson here represents not a visual and corporeal rhetoric of childhood as separate from adulthood, but a rhetoric of childhood as development. 
This idea of childhood contrasts with that Dodson ascribed to girls. In Dodson's photographs of girls, they are represented as an ideal to inspire the adult and are defined as separate from adulthood. Girlhood is a static concept, indeed appropriately visualized by the stasis of photography, and is a finished product, a fully conceived state of being. Dodson's photographs of boys, however, are about the process undergone during boyhood, growth, change, and becoming. These photographs figure a manly boyhood, a boyhood as defined by Arnold's rugby, Hughes Tom Brown's school days, and ideas of Christian manliness that contained the seeds of the man. While I have suggested elsewhere that Dodson's photographs of the Little Sisters, his photograph by Dodson you see on the right, establish a naturalized visual rhetoric to represent child bodies as distinct from adult bodies, these schoolboy photographs attempt to make visible a connection between childhood and adulthood that Dodson ascribes to boyhood only. Dodson's photographs of Harry Little further illustrate the contrast of the schoolboy and the domestic <laughs> little girl. Harry was, in fact, Dodson's first interest among the little children, and Dodson photographed Harry several times before he began photographing Lorena, Alice, and Edith. One of Suffy's photograph albums contains an early photograph of Harry that Suffy took while Dodson looked on. This photograph of nine-year-old Harry shows him in profile with long, messy hair covered by a cap. Like some of the earliest photographs of his sisters, such as this one of eight-year-old Lorena on the right, Harry looks tired and sullen, droopy and cranky, like a child. <coughs> In a later photograph, an older 12-year-old Harry is by now a pupil at Twyford. In this photograph, the growing discipline of his boy body is made visible. While Harry's expression still appears unhappy and forlorn, his body, seated at an angle on a chair, is calm and rigid, hands crossed on his lap, in a position of restraint. Dodson's photographs show Harry developing the same somatic control visible in the other Twyford schoolboys, while Lorena, Alice, and Edith would continue to be photographed in more childlike poses. The last photograph Dodson took of Harry is of Harry at 13 in 1860 with his three sisters. Dodson places Harry in the most dignified and adult spot by seating him in the chair. Harry sits confidently with legs crossed, hands clasped via cricket back, which, as we have seen in the photograph of Twyford's cricket team, had become a potent symbol of boyish masculinity. Lorena and Edith frame Harry on either side. Dodson has placed Lorena, the oldest, in the most undignified position by perching her on the arm of the chair and Edith leans against its side. Alice is closest to Harry in her more poised position, legs crossed like her elder brother, and in her bold gaze at Dodson. She's always the boldest among the three girls. Two years later, in 1862, Dodson would register 15-year-old Harry's growth by describing him in his diary as, quote, growing up into a fine youth, unquote. But within a few more years, in 1865, Dodson tellingly describes the 12-year-old Alice's own growth as awkward. He noted in his diary that he, quote, met Alice and Miss Prickett, her governess, in the quadrangle. Alice seems changed a good deal and hardly for the better, probably going through the usual awkward stage of transition, unquote. Dodson contrasts what he perceives as the positive transition of growing up for the boy, Harry, but views the girl Alice's transition into womanhood negatively. Visits with Harry continued when he was home for the holidays, but they were necessarily much rarer than Dodson's visits with Harry's sisters. In April 1863, the then 16-year-old Harry makes one of his last appearances in Dodson's diaries, and Dodson has soured on him. Dodson wrote, quote, Harry Little came to ask me to go with them down the river. Harry sculled by himself, managed to be always in the way, and generally rather spoiled what would otherwise have been a very pleasant expedition. As a boy home from school, <coughs> Harry's attempt to renegotiate his earlier friendship with Dodson failed, at least on that particular occasion, because his behavior seems to be inappropriate adolescent high spirits, rather than the more desirable qualities of a schoolboy, as a young gentleman or a fine youth. To conclude, in the Twyford photographs, 
the schoolboys are photographed as young gentlemen. The crossed legs, straight backs, whether seated or standing, and swaggering contrapuntal postures are bodies that are gaining mastery. Despite their freedom and intimacy with their masters, schoolboys are under constant scrutiny. Their bodies carry the knowledge of the threat of discipline from the masters and the threat of bullying from their peers. They also carry the pride and confidence of duty and responsibility, the knowledge of their class position and their future as good citizens. The schoolboys have learned to behave like little men. As little men, their poses and attitudes have to be consciously public. They develop both into a collective social body in the sense of the school as a community, and individually, each boy internalizes his own social body, in the words of the epigraph to Tom Brown's school days. He learns at school to act and live it. As Dodson remarked in his diary, a key characteristic of the institution of the preparatory school and the public school was the lack of privacy given to the individual boys. The boys in Dodson's and Suffy's photographs show off their education and their gentlemanliness in a public performance. <coughs> In contrast, Dodson's photographs of his girl child friends are private, revealing a relationship between Dodson and the girl that generally remains personal. The friendship and the photograph take place in the female dominated space of the nursery and sitting room, or on walks, or in the photograph studio, spaces where Dodson entertain children with stories, puzzles, and games. It is an important point that Dodson usually insisted on the company of the girl alone, without parents or governesses whenever possible, so that she can relax and unselfconsciously be a girl and a child around him. For Dodson, girl children resided in the foreign country of childhood, while boy children were soon abandoned it on their way to manhood. Dodson, the photographer, relates to the boys with a different kind of sympathy one that both understands the disciplined life of the boy at school, but also judges the boy for his success at learning gentlemanliness, as in Dodson's relationship with Harry Little. Dodson occupies a position of authority and stands opposite his boy subjects as an example of their end goal as he posed them for his camera. Dodson chooses to photograph boys together in groups and with their masters because to be a boy requires the presence of teachers and peers to act and live in a world of men and requires the boy to become a man. Thank you. on how much light there was. Um, it, it could probably be anywhere from 10 seconds to 30 seconds to a minute. Oh, yes, I mean, clearly that, you know, but I think Dodson understood that he was working within this framework of this amount of time. And I think he paid a lot of careful attention to how he was posing the, the children, knowing they would have to sit there for a while. Oh. Yes. One thing that Dawson never seemed to have said to his subjects was, now smile. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's true. Is that a characteristic of him or the custom of photographers of the day? Um, the question was about smiling in photographs. Was that a choice of, made by Dodson, or was that um, something that was more customary? In general, it was more customary. Um, you know, you, when we think about 19th century photographs of people, they really don't start smiling until probably around the turn of the century. Um, Certainly, probably not until the 1880s when the snapshot camera is invented. Um, you know, it's clearly, even if you're posing for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, it would be difficult to hold a smile like that. And, and Dodson did do one photograph of a little girl smiling um, of the Flora, Flora Rankin. And he was very proud of that photograph, but felt that that was actually a photograph where he was being able, he was able to demonstrate emotion. He actually even thought about sending it to Charles Darwin as a potential illustration for his um, emotions of animals um, um, book. So anyway, I clearly it was possible to photograph people smiling, but it was very difficult. But I also think that given the sort of tradition of portraiture, smiling would not have been 
wouldn't have been a look that you were that you would have found desirable. Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, this particular group of schoolboys was sort of a one or two time thing. You know, he did about maybe ten photographs um, of his in, during his visit to Twyford. But you know, I think it's it's really you know any time he photographs a family where there is a boy. Um, you know, among the siblings, you do, he generally did take a photograph of the boys. I mean, yes, he photographed Exie Kitchen a lot more than Brooke and Hugh Kitchen, the younger brothers, but they do appear in photographs. And he was, um, he clearly was very taken with some of the boys, like Hallam Tennyson and Lionel Tennyson, um, who, and I just, I just didn't have time to talk about that in, in, um, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a number, <laughs> but I mean, maybe, you know, 10 to 20 percent of his photographs of children were, were of boys. You know, because these, these boys are preparatory school age. It is actually before they went to public school, before they went to rugby. And I can't think of any examples except for maybe of his brothers, um, of Dodson's own brothers, that he photographed when they were actually what we would call teenagers. It generally was sort of preparatory school age or younger, um, or adults, adult males. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly bullying continued, um, and I think there was some <coughs> looking the other way. I mean, it was sort of an understanding that this was going to happen, and you know, there are so many, there are lots of memoirs of, you know, I mean, Dodson is not the only man who looked back on his time at public school as a very miserable period of his life. I think that Arnold's reforms were attempting to control the bullying because it had been extremely out of control before, before Arnold started to um, try to, you know. Uh, exert a lot more discipline over the boys, but I, I don't think that it was ever, it was ever something that he expected to eradicate. Um, and, you know, of course, in the sense that he was practicing corporal punishment too, I mean, yeah, I think life at, life at the British public school was a very violent one. Yes? One question. You know, I do not know that. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. But that is interesting. I would love to know if he was. Um, one thing that I find interesting is actually Hubert Perry, the composer, was also a student at Twyford School at the time that Dodson was, was visiting, although it doesn't seem to be someone that he, he came across or associated with, at least according to you know, the records that we have. <laughs> yes? I think that you have, when you look at these pictures, I mean, he couldn't have photographed girls at school because they didn't go to school. Yes. And it's not just his picture of them that kept them children and kept them young until they reached a certain age. All the society was down there. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I'm certainly trying to argue that Dodds him, himself was taking an interest in this and he wanted to photograph this boys in this particular way, but, but it's clearly, you know, it's the culture that is developing girls in this one way and developing boys in the other. Thank you very much.